Good evening and welcome to the panel discussion on digital innovations in business. I have a very, very eminent panel of guests today, starting with Dr. Mohan Beer Eswani, who is an Associate Dean for Digital Innovation at Ke Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern University. He is an academic, he is a consultant, he is a speaker, an author on business innovation, modern marketing, AI applications and product management. Dr. Sony has been a prolific author, a prolific researcher and a top level academician in the area of marketing. We next have Mr. Shiv Mehta who is an MBA at NYU Stern School of Business and he is author of a book called Protocols of Money, a limited partner at a Sydney based venture capital firm and he is an investor in blockchain and metaverse companies. We have Dr. Dominic Kanbach, who is Assistant Professor of Strategic Entrepreneurship and Research Lead at Porsche AG Chair of Strategic Management and Digital Entrepreneurship and Head of Strategic Entrepreneurship Research Group at AJHA Leipzig School of Management. His main research focus is on the area of corporate entrepreneurship and strategic management. Welcome to the panelist. First question to Dr. Sony is, India is thriving with digital transactions. How do you, how do you think real-time transactions can change the business environment across all levels? Yeah, I think that digital transactions and digital payments um, are moving along very quickly in India and, and that is because um, the pain point was acute. If you look at pain points in billing, particularly the long tail billing, transit billing, um, particularly in small towns and rural areas, uh, the very low credit card penetration, which is just about 25 million, 30 million credit cards in a country of 1.3 billion people. So there was a rich untapped potential, uh, which is why digital transactions have not taken off in the US because there is no problem to solve. Everybody has credit cards and debit cards, so the convenience proposition is, uh, is not that strong. And uh, in addition to that, some really pioneering work done by the government to build the rails, uh, the NPCI and the UPI and uh, infrastructure, the India stack, has put us in a very good position in this country uh, to enable the real-time transactions. And what that does is it basically reduces friction in business. It allows money to move faster. It allows more money to be moved into the formal sector, the banking sector, uh, less cash. Um, so, and then obviously on top of this stack, you can build very interesting startup businesses and business models uh, when the underlying infrastructure has been put in place. So all in all, I think after China, India is probably going to be a leader in this uh, digital transaction space. And uh, it's a, it's, it's a unique, rare example of the government actually leading the way and uh, then the private sector following. So um, it's a real success story in my opinion. Th thank you and uh, yes, surely UPI is a innovation of a global proportion and that has really, really changed the landscape of small payments in this country. Uh, coming to Dr. Dominic Kanbach, uh, how do you think digital strategies can en enhance customer satisfaction or customer experience? Any particular examples from developing or the developed world among, yeah. about this? So, uh, I'm totally convinced that digital technologies and yeah, digital strategies can significantly enhance uh, customer experience and ultimately also, also uh, customer satisfaction. Um, so there's basically two ways on how companies achieve that. One is to add some digital component to existing products, right? And if you, if you look at this, for example, if you look today into the travel industry, uh, we all book our tickets online. We all book our hotels online, right? It's basically still the same product that we had decades ago, but now it's more customer friendly, it's a better user experience, it's easier for us to do because the digital component was added to this existing business model. But 
It's also a second part which digital strategies enable and um, which is, in my opinion, the yeah, creation of totally new value through digital, through digital components. And um, when you are asking for um, yeah, examples from the developed world, from the developed countries, uh, what we see currently in, in Europe very, very intensely is this ultra-fast e-commerce trend, this e-commerce on demand. So, for example, uh, in, in, in the European Union, we now have companies that deliver groceries to your door within 10 minutes, right? And we see business models like this also uh, in the US and other parts of the world. So it's really this fast commerce. E-commerce is there what we have already, what we all use. When I walk here on campus, I see students picking up Amazon parcels from the, from the gates, right? But now this next trend really is, is this really ultra fast commerce getting your things in 10 minutes, right? This is extremely crazy time, right? So, and this works because many different digital components work together, not only at the customer side, but also in the back, in the operations. So it's completely digitized processes that enable then, of course, in the end, uh, yeah, um, great customer experience in that way, and also uh, then in ultimately some higher customer satisfaction. Thank you, great example and quick commerce and as you say ultra fast commerce is also picking up in India. A lot of companies are, it's becoming a very, 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 very competitive space. Uh, coming to me, Professor Mehta, since you are from the crypto blockchain, the next question is on that. On this, do you believe that a crypto, all crypto reality is, is, is on the, in the future where we, crypto will penetrate into many aspects of business than what it is today. Yeah, so I like to believe so, that crypto will definitely take over a lot than what it is now. To give you an example, I'm from Australia. Um, and yeah, like I know people in the crypto ecosystem over there quite well in a senior levels. Um, recently, there is a company called Crypto.com that I've done a partnership. Uh, so you can go to a gas station I know we call it petrol pumps in India, but you can go to a petrol pump in Australia and uh, you can pay by crypto. You can, you know, do transactions by crypto. And I'm pretty sure in the US there are, you know, uh, crypto credit cards and debit cards as well. Uh, so is, I definitely think crypto is uh, going to be more prevalent in the economy. Uh, but yeah, it is dependent upon the jurisdiction. Uh, so, you know, I know I'm aware that in India, for example, crypto has been banned as a payment mechanism. So, of course, uh, companies like Crypto.com and their technology, they can't really operate within the Indian jurisdictions with that. But to give you another example, this is more of an extreme example. El Salvador is a country which not many people might be familiar with, but it's a country uh, where they have legalized Bitcoin. So over there, if you go to McDonald's in El Salvador, you can actually you get an option over there that do you want to pay by Bitcoin? So I like to believe that as jurisdictions and regulatory authorities, firstly, understand the technology, understand what it is capable of. Uh, they'll make it uh, more prevalent in the ecosystem. Uh, but I'll also say something about blockchain technology because crypto is a subsect of the blockchain technology. Blockchain technology is one thing that is going to take over literally every business out there, every digital business out there. Blockchain will have a massive role in it. Um, and uh, how it will disrupt right from supply chain, uh, right from you know making our exchanges more efficient. Uh, so blockchain is basically one technology that is going to be more disruptive than I argue even the printing press was back in the, those days, middle ages. Thank you, and uh, from this year onwards, our students' um, mark sheets, everything will be on blockchain. So this convocation, students will get a, their certificates which will have a blockchain code. So, so it is pervading everywhere. Coming back to Dr. Sony, uh, we, talk, we hear about metaverse. A lot of discussion about metaverse. What is metaverse and where we are headed? I know it's a, it, it, it elicits a very long answer, but however, just if you can summarize for the, for, for, for the audience here. Yeah. 
So um, the metaverse is basically a set of environments. There's not one metaverse, there are different metaverse platforms. But the idea is to create a three-dimensional immersive environment um, within which you have a representation of the self as an avatar, so you are present. And it is fostered by a creator economy who creates you know, these and, and as well as brands. And the emphasis is on activities and experiences. You know, until now we interacted with information and content, but in the metaverse we will be in it. So it's actually a shift from information and content to activities and experiences. So that's the idea. So it's immersive, it's pervasive, it's three-dimensional, there's uh, avatar representation of yourself. And if you look at it that way, then essentially it can create an alternative representation of everything you do in life. You shop, you learn, you entertain yourself, you socialize, you date, you you know, have corporate meetings, you do design, you do engineering, all that can be replicated. Not only replicated, but extended. I think this is a, uh, we'll miss the boat if we only think about replicating. So for instance, if you can run a concert in the metaverse, not only can you scale it to 10 million people, but everybody can have a front row seat. So there are possibilities of not only replicating, but extending the real world in ways that have not been possible before. So uh, conceptually, it's a wide open you know, set of use cases and possibilities, but that's the problem too, that uh, the, there is a lot of confusion a lot about what will be the right use cases, there's a lot of experimentation going on, and, uh, and there are, there's a lack of standards. Ideally, if I have an endowment, if I own an asset, I should be able to take that with me from one platform to the other, uh, interoperability. So those standards have not been established yet. So uh, a lot remains to be solved. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, I'll use a Hindi expression. It says, ke, Sher basa nahi par mangte fail gaye. So the village has not been settled, but the beggars have already arrived. So the nefarious activities, the fraudsters, the you know, molesters, they have already arrived in the metaverse before consumers have. So it's a, it's kind of a shady neighborhood right now. So, uh, so that's something we will also have to kind of deal with. Uh, in the world of NFTs, a lot of fraud, a lot of intellectual property theft. Um, so it's, it's, it's still very much in the throes of its formation of galaxies and the once the dust settles, I think it has enormous potential. So in summary, I'd say in the short run, it's overhyped. In the long run, it's underhyped. So stay tuned. Thank you, and that's a very, very apt summary of what is happening in Metaverse. Uh, next question to Dr. Kanbak. Uh, what would you, what would be your advice for entrepreneurs who are starting an all digital business? How do they go about it? Yes, so maybe a comment on the metaverse. So I'm also totally agreeing on what we have heard here, and uh, I think it will really have a fundamental impact also on the topics we discussed before, like customer experience, customer satisfaction, and. Yeah, today you see already so many companies trying things out, right? And it's exactly uh, the situation as described. Uh, we still are in the way of finding use cases, what it can really be, but many companies trying things out. And this is also important to get this shady neighborhood maybe into yeah, a better place. Uh, and yeah, so I'm looking forward to see uh, many things there. And of course, talking about entrepreneurs, right? What is uh, a recommendation yeah, one can give to young entrepreneurs building something up in a purely digital world, maybe in the metaverse, so the first thing I would recommend is, and this goes into maybe a little bit of the direction of the metaverse, is don't start with the technology, 
right? And we have heard this uh, from Dr. Mohambia before. The problem to be solved, right? When you were talking about uh, the credit card and digital payment uh, uh, and compared India and, uh, and the US, right? The US didn't have this problem of uh, low credit card coverage, right? So start with a problem. Right? It's not about the technology first and then thinking, okay, so I want to do something with AI, I want to do something with blockchain and then desperately looking for a problem that you want to solve, right? Start with the problem and then fix the problem solution fit, right? So first understand really where some pain points of people are, understand uh, um, their daily lives and what could be a problem that you want to solve and then select the technology second. Um, second point I would like to recommend is, yeah, go out and um, yeah, develop your business in a structured way. So talk to people that have done it. Don't try to just do it alone on your desk, in your dorm. Use the opportunities that are here at Voxen University with Trade Tower, where experienced entrepreneurs share their stories and their support. Use an incubator program, something that we also have at HHL in, in Germany, structured incubation program over 12 weeks, where you really try to fix this, what I mentioned, problem solution fit, and come up with something, come up with an MVP. So basically go out and talk to people and yeah, get structured support. And last but not least, um, I can only say, yeah, be fast, right? And also fail fast, right? Uh, we all know that Nine out of 10 ideas uh, might end yeah. up in the trash, but that's fine, okay? Fail fast, right? You need to experience this failure very, very fast and then get up again and look for the next one, right? Don't be too fixed on this one single thing that you have in your mind and try to make it work by any cost. No, fail fast, right? And start over again. This is what uh, makes a good entrepreneur. To, to sum up, so I would say, really, don't start with the technology, but Find a problem you want to fix. Second, look for structured support. And third, fail fast. Great uh, nuggets of um, wisdom. I think uh, understanding the problem and then finding a tool and not the other way around is the way to go. Uh, my next question is to Professor Mehta. We heard about democratizing AI. What about blockchain? Is it, isn't it too elite? Yeah. So, um, blockchain is already democratized when you think about it. Uh, there are, and this is what uh, I'm teaching my students at the moment, you know, you have public permissionless blockchains like Bitcoin, uh, like Ethereum, and then you've got enterprise blockchains like Amazon have got quantum ledger database. They got their managed blockchain offerings. And there's a company, VMware, uh, that is helping the Australian Stock Exchange at the moment to replace their legacy system to now use blockchain settlement for you know, uh, stock market transactions. So blockchain is already democratized in a way. Like if anybody wants to develop decentralized applications, they can just go to the Ethereum network. Uh, they would need some Ethereum to make the application go live, but they can learn the language, Solidity, uh, they can use the test network, and they can build decentralized applications. And then if they are good uh, with the points that uh, Professor has raised over here, find the problem, find the solution, and if blockchain fits into that solution, then yeah, use it. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, it is already democratized. You have those public permissionless blockchains available. You do need internet connection, you do need uh, money to buy those cryptos so that you can use their uh, virtual network, but it's already democratized. It's not like AI where um, you only have those front end applications um, and you know, use it. Uh, you can use those open AI thing, but it requires again a lot of money. Uh, and the algorithms, they are like not really open source in a way, uh, but blockchain, uh, if you see those blockchain networks like Ethereum, it's entirely open source. People can fork it. People can fork Bitcoin and create their own network. And, uh, but what they can't replicate is the network effects of the blockchain. Uh, so I believe it's already democratized. I think what is lacking with blockchain is 
the learning. There is a big education and learning curve in order to adapt it. And uh, like Professor said over here as well, what applied to Metaverse applies to crypto as well. People, uh, you know, do not really think about crypto from a positive light, especially in this country. Uh, but if you look at Australia, if you look at Germany, uh, if you look at U.S., especially under President Biden, everybody has is everybody are coming up with progressive crypto laws, uh, and businesses are uh, flourishing. New business models are coming in. Um, since I've been in India, I've uh, you know I'm in venture capital, so I see a lot of metaverse startups being pitched to me because it is overhyped at the moment. Uh, and since I've come to India, what I've come across is that. There's a very famous saying, uh, at least in Bangalore, when I visited it. Uh, they said that Dubai has become the fastest growing Indian city. That's what they say now. Why? Because people in Bangalore all want to create like a blockchain or a metaverse startup. But they can't because of the you know, regulations. They are not sure about it. So that's why they're flying to Dubai, like most crypto businesses like Binance and all, setting up a headquarters there and having the intellectual talent over here building on those networks. Uh, so I believe it's already democratized. Um, and uh, j I'll make a quick point about the metaverse because I feel it's important since uh, you asked those questions. Facebook very famously has done a rebranding, right? They named their company Meta. And after that, metaverse became really overhyped. Facebook is a centralized, it's a company. It's a centralized entity. Metaverse, uh, when you look at any of the metaverse projects, it looks like a video game. You know, we had Second Life. There was a... Some, if people are as old as me, they would know that there was a uh, you know, project called Second Life back in the uh, mid-2000. It was a metaverse, it was a virtual world. But what didn't work for them was that it was a company that had issued its own Linden dollars at that time. So what we are seeing at the moment, and that's purely because of blockchain technology, is that we are seeing an evolution of the internet. We call it Web3. I know Jack Dorsey calls it Web5 now, but we are still, I believe, in Web 2.5. And what's the evolution of it is that Web 1 started in the late 80s where we only used to see the internet, we used to see the websites, and we can only read it. Web 2 became read and write, where you, know, you can upload videos. So that was the Web 2 version. Web 3 is not only read, write, but its own. You, know? you have the ability to create a wallet on any of the blockchain networks out there and own what you do. So now you see play to earn video games. So now not only you have bragging rights that, uh, oh yeah, I finished Call of Duty in two days, but now you can actually play a video game and whatever you get, it is owned within your decentralized wallet and you can trade it. Uh, so the future of metaverse, I, in my humble opinion, is not gonna be the centralized Facebook metaverse. It is gonna be a decentralized me metaverse where people own their own wallet and they own whatever they do in that metaverse economy, they have that within their own wallet and they are free to trade it. Uh, and that is what it means permissionless. Whereas with companies, it is all permissioned. Fantastic. And we'll finish off our discussion with the last question to Dr. Sony. Uh, we know you are a poetry lover and you have uh, written books of poetry. Do you believe the literature as a business structure will be further affected by, say, a latest technology by, say, artificial intelligence? Yeah, AI as poet, I think that's a interesting thought process and speculation. You know, we believed until now that uh, AI has, uh, we, there are two types of intelligence, sort of uh, very broadly speaking, sort of the informationalist intelligence and expressive intelligence. So informational intelligence is um, making decisions based on data, analysis of data, hard data, and that's what algorithms are very good at, better than the human beings in many cases. Uh, but expressive intelligence is where you see patterns, you need empathy, you need intuition, you need insight, you need cultural context, uh, and that is what humans are really good at. And expressive intelligence is at the very foundation of art and literature. And uh, so um, I think for the first wave of AI, we believe that artists are safe. 
poets are safe because algorithms don't have soul they don't have you know but uh, they don't they don't have heart uh, but they're coming for you they're coming for you they've already come to the world of art where i think christie's auctioned a this is 3 years ago they auctioned up ai created painting for half a million dollars so essentially you can do style transfer you can say make me this painting like in monet or van gogh so they're starting to do some really interesting stuff ai is writing press releases today to analyzing writing financial statements today tomorrow it might be writing essays it might be writing uh, today ai is uh, figuring out what scenes to take in a movie and make a trailer tomorrow it might be actually designing movies and a combination of understanding what patterns work um, as as well as cgi getting to the point where with deep fakes you don't even know if that's marilyn monroe come back to life or is it a real person so um, it is going to be interesting to watch um, the creative arts are under attack well i don't know if they're under attack or they're progressing um, but uh, i think that we will start to see more and more action in this in this, in this space so that doesn't mean human beings suddenly are without jobs or poets are even poorer than they are today um, but uh, what it does mean is that we will need to evolve towards higher and higher levels of expression and expressive intelligence just like in the algorithmic world now you know humans are not going to get re- replaced but they are going to make the higher order decisions so um, so i think it'll be interesting to watch and i i still believe that the acronym ai should stand for augmented intelligence or assisted intelligence and not artificial intelligence because it will be the combination of human beings and algorithms that i think will define the future so um, that and it it will be interesting to watch so i i don't think the time is far away when you will see poetry written by algorithms so um, yeah so maybe that will be my next book of poetry so it's, a, it's i think it is fascinating it is interesting but uh, never underestimate the human being right ultimately we built this stuff so i i'm still an optimist that we are not heading towards hell or you know human machines are not skynet is not going to take over the world although skynet may become sentient i think that still is a possibility ai is getting closer and closer to by the way i don't know omni if you know this but that uh, uh, algorithmic capacity is following moore's law open ai did a did a study except that the half life between 2012 and 2019 is not 18 months as per moore's law it's 3.4 months which means algorithmic capacity is ex- doubling every 3.4 months what that means just to put it in context between 2012 and 2019 uh, algorithmic capacity has gone up 300000 times and it's doubling every 3 months so uh, what does that mean 5 years out i can't do the math in my head or i can say the singularity is closer than we think um so some very interesting ethical questions will be raised in the future so um, exciting times stay tuned thank you and that was a very very interesting panel discussion we talked from we talked across we talked from about india's payment apps to metaverse to digital businesses we talked about digital strategies we talked about blockchain we talked about democratic blockchain we talked about ai c- capability rising and mm, as dr sony predicted maybe the singularity event is closer than what we think yeah.